Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I am joined by Cy Hudson, co-designer and co-owner of Hudson Hudson Manufacturing, right? Hudson Manufacturing. Uh, and they have the brand new Hudson H9 pistol. And we talked to you at SHOT Show last year, and uh, you were pretty excited about the pistol, but you were you guys were like swamped with people. And so you said, yeah, at some point we'll do a video on the, the prototypes, the, the boat anchor and um, the brick. That's right. And so today we have uh, the brick yep. and the boat anchor and a prototype Hudson and an basically production line Hudson. Production line, uh, slight finish issues with this uh, is one of the testing prototype models right before we went into production. Okay. And uh, slight differences between the two and that was why we wanted to bring the proof of concept pistol to show you the, the trigger safety and uh, some improvements for the insert chassis. Okay, so what we're going to do is take a look at the we're going to do the classic forgotten weapons thing on a weapon that hasn't been forgotten yet because it's just barely gotten onto the market. It's been um, good. Good. Well, it'll be really cool to take a look at where this thing actually came from. So yeah. give us the 30-second the overview of how this all started. It apparently was Microsoft Paint. Uh, well, we had a, <laughs> a, the green sketchbook, which uh, we put out on uh, social media, and that turned into a lot of Microsoft Paint and PowerPoint uh, when we hired our first engineer, sending him basically, here's what we're looking for, here's the ideas. Um, really quick for the brick, the major uh, move forward to where we eventually ended up was moving the uh, the lugs on the barrel forward and down and moving okay. the cool spring down forward. The boat anchor. So all down in this area instead yep. of being right up here with your locking lugs in the hood. Okay. But you, you can see that we still don't have a low uh, bore axis or a high grip purchase on the on the rear of the pistol. Right, not on this one. Nope. And then for the, uh, it's actually harder to see, but for the boat anchor, our big uh, big breakthrough there was moving the interaction between the sear and the trigger bow. It was directly to an actual trigger yoke uh, hitting a, a lever. Okay. And so that was the big improvement there, but still. You still have a lot of space there. And then, once we got the proof of concept pistol, we finally got to that high grip purchase. So the whole purpose of this initial idea to move the locking lugs and the recoil spring down was what? We wanted to... Well, backing up for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, we, kept on, we kept on seeing what designers were doing. We're moving the hands up. Uh, I kept on doing undercuts uh, for getting that as high grip perch as possible. Low bore axis, the term, came into vogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were like, yeah, but you're getting an off axis shooting technique. You're introducing movement into how you're holding the pistol, and then you have a rotational trigger. Why don't you bring the slide down to the hand? And so you can keep a straight grip on the pistol okay. and still, uh, still have that low bore axis. And so that's, we were not satisfied with either of where these brought us because at the time, you can see we were still trying to keep safeties involved. Right. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and let's take a closer look at these and start at the oldest one and progress our way through to where you have them now. Oh, it'll be fun. But taking them apart, rather easy. Putting them back together doesn't get easy until we get to the final. <laughs> All right. Alrighty, so this is what you're calling the brick. The brick. It is kind of vaguely brick-like. Uh, it's actually very brick-like. <laughs> and this was your first, uh, what would you call it? Not first proof of concept, but it's first prototype? First working prototype. Okay. And, and we say working very, very lightly. <laughs> <laughs> now, the finish on this is, this, this looks like a casting, except if we look at the markings, Focus in. There we go. Um, solid Concepts. I think I recognize that name. Uh, we, it, yeah, we had moved to Austin. They had just finished their 3D printed 1911. They were interested in uh, doing something else. So it was uh, it was uh, pretty fun whenever we did that. I'm sure, yeah. So for people who don't remember, this was you know, a couple of years ago. There was this big, it was, all, it was big in the, the gun media at the time, of this company that made a completely 3D printed 1911. Like everything except the springs. And they were trying to sell it for like a quarter million dollars. <laughs> uh, but that's the same company. And you actually had this whole pistol 3D printed. Yes, I don't recommend that uh, for people <laughs> if they're trying to start out. It just it, it was a very porous material uh, is how it ended. They, they hadn't quite uh, dialed in their vacuum sealing or anything uh, like that. 
uh, but it did mean you could iterate in the space of two to three weeks. Okay. Um, but whenever you're dialing in your tolerances and you're trying to have less friction when you're doing a me mechanical operating system, that was very difficult. Lauren mentioned that. She's like, oh my God, so much friction. <laughs> <laughs> and I can totally see it. So obviously these parts are finish machined, and then spaces like the inside the trigger guard here, which are really rough. I mean, it it really does look and feel like a rough casting. Absolutely. Um, so obviously those you know these areas didn't matter for the sake of a prototype. Interesting that you put the uh, the accessory rail even on the very first prototype. Well, uh, there were very very few. I didn't see it as really an option with a modern uh, pistol with the weapon mounted light crowd is very, very uh, prevalent, and okay. it's something that we wanted to figure out how to support. We also need to see what it would look like visually, because you can only no, see so much on the screen. That's true, yeah. Um, and it looks like you do not have any sort of trigger safety on this. Instead, you have the manual safety, um, yep. ambidextrous manual safety. And this looks like a 1911 grip safety, but of course it's not. Uh, and I think you probably are still getting some comments on that right up to the production guns. We are. Because um, it does kind of look like they have grip safeties. It is. It does look like that, and that was for an, a visual aesthetic, but it's also a reference point for whenever you grab the pistol. One of the things that I oh. love about my 1911 is I know if I'm, when it hits the web in my hand, where I'm actually getting my grip purchase, if I need to adjust while I'm doing a mag change or anything else. Okay. I did never think about that. That makes sense. So, uh, of course, the mechanical thing about this is normally with a browning gun, the locking lugs are right up here in the hood of the barrel, or hood of the slide. You've moved them down here. So, uh, you mentioned that you like watching me attempt to figure stuff out on video. So, it's up to me to try and figure out how to get this apart. So, I'm pretty sure from looking at the production Hudsons that this pin comes out. So, let's see if we can... Aha! 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 Now, on the modern ones, we rotate that. No, I think. Is that a captive pin? Semi captive right. pin. Pull hard enough, you'll get it. And. Slide's coming forward. Uh, no. I'll just take that all the way out. You have to pull the trigger on it. Okay. Uh. All right, I'm going to hand this off to you, Cy. <laughs> All right, see if I can do this on camera. <sighs> oh, I oh, screwed no. it up, didn't I? I broke the gun. I don't think that's what's happening. Oh, I know what it is. There's a clearance that was not figured out on this for that ejection. <laughs> Okay, now you know, I have to take it off camera. There you know, goes. people always ask, like, have you ever broken a gun that you're playing with? Well, yeah, shit. I had to pop it back in to here, and then if you go back, stop it, pull the trigger, and then go forward. Okay, you're gonna be able to do it. Oh, now, now. Oh, now it's all over. <laughs> That's more fun that way. Let's see what I got going on back here. I don't understand why this wasn't the production version. Me neither. Right? Your third hand you used to get that going. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> problem has been solved. So, <laughs> <laughs> brief cut there while Sai fixed the gun. Um, so at this point, what we do is drop the slide, bring it to right about there, pull the trigger, and then the slide comes off the front. And on this one, you have a non-captive recoil spring. That's that's quite a beefy. Uh, is that actually like motorcycle suspension part right there? It, it looks definitely more familiar, like to an old Sig style um, big spring. Oh, and then yeah. So the barrel here is really cool. Let me zoom in on that. Actually, this is slightly different than uh, than even the next prototype, isn't it? Because it is. yeah. All right, so. These lugs right here are what are going to, let's see, are these locking lugs or is it locking on the hood of the the top of the barrel? So they are locking lugs. They are circular locking lugs, which didn't work very well, and especially for design for manufacturability. Okay, and so they're locking into these little 
lollipops right there, mm -hmm. like, okay, like so. And then when it tilts, it's so it, going to. So go it ahead. starts that takedown pin that we took out is resting right there. Okay. And so it's resting right here. Gotcha. And then popping in the place. Ah, gotcha. Okay. So nice. Okay. And then interestingly on this one, that barrel is way thicker than it needs to be. We call that the howitzer. Um, <laughs> you can see it could basically be an artillery piece sitting there. Yep. <laughs> uh, one of the things we did whenever, uh, and it was it was a it was a mistake, um, is that the barrel is big enough to be a forty-five. Okay. Well, a lot of your reference material was based on the nineteen eleven. Correct. And the initial the drafting engineer that you guys hired wasn't a gun guy at first, right? He actually, or do I have that backwards? He had uh, he had experience. He he knew guns, and he had had experience designing revolvers. Okay, so so in theory, one could approach this as we're going to make a pistol that can be set up with nine or forty five caliber barrels. Uh, we kind of talk about the difficulty in actually converting calibers elsewhere, but uh, if that would have been the intent, we would have definitely felt better about the. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got the huge barrel here, and then. Yeah, that's a, a very unique locking uh, locking lug sort of set up there. And almost impossible in a manufacturing uh, standpoint to get right. There's a, there's a couple ways you could approach it, but how it was drawn up, 3D printed, was the only way we could integrate it into that frame. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. So it seems like the, uh, the best way to make this machinable is to redesign it as something else. Yes. <laughs> But there's a lot of interesting, fun stuff for you to look at within that frame. All right, so it's got a nice little tiny return spring for the trigger there. Um, what else is in there? One of the interesting things in talking to you for what seems like a couple of days now is how interested um, you and Lauren always like focus in on trigger groups. And trigger groups are something that it, that's if. Yeah, that's definitely my weak point in firearms design. I'm always looking at like the locking assembly, and I don't usually pay a whole lot of attention to the fire control groups. And every time we pull out a new pistol, you're like, "Oh wow, how does that trigger work?" This clearly has been one of the areas that was that required the most study and iteration and and creativity on your part. It had to have been thirty to four iterations for the sear and the trigger interface. Jeez. Absolutely. So on this one, let's see. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to see here, really, what's going on, but you're pulling this sear down. When it goes back, it goes down. It's on a ramp. Which is presumably going to, let's take a look at our slide here. I'm assuming that's going to pull on a striker here, pull it back far enough, and then release it and let it snap forward. Yep. And then I assume this is an out of battery a safety. Yep. So if, if that's not depressed, the striker can't actually go all the way forward. Just going to prevent it from firing should it somehow should the sear slip off the striker while it's cycling. Yep. There's the breech face right there. Um, all right. So what else am I missing on here? Okay. I'm, I'm sure there's something in the trigger group I'm missing. Well, so originally you can check out the completely ambidextrous. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Uh, mag magazine release, and the craziest part is if you look down here, it's offset. So oh, that we could huh. use a pre-existing magazine design. Okay. I recommend that for no oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the internet really likes they, the internet really dislikes proprietary magazines. The, so the the way we're trying to address that is make them readily available. Uh, hitting uh, sorry for a shameless plug. Hitting e-commerce soon. <laughs> Uh, Excellent. And no MSRP at no greater than thirty four ninety nine. Okay. And as a small company, that was a hard pill to swallow, but I do believe it's still the right choice. Okay, I would agree. The so why not uh, use an existing magazine? Uh, it's, it's because of how far we dropped our slide on top of the framework grip that that's where the magazine cuts ended up being. Okay. And so we had to do it offset, and it was one of our early realizations. Uh, we were using a Wilson Combat KZ9 mags with uh, just stock. That's what okay. we were using initially because it was a 9mm double stack with the 1911 inspiration. Okay. 
So yeah. it's, it's just the amount of extra complexity to have offset magazine release in order to accommodate that. Yep. Okay. Like I said, if, if someone figures it out, hit me up. I'd be interested, but uh, I don't <laughs> recommend it. The other thing is that you have that Glock style trigger bar attached to a 1911 style yoke. And we've mentioned the Alchemy Spectre. That was also hmm. their solution. Whenever we designed this, I had not found the print or the drawings for the Spectre. So we arrived at a similar conclusion. Oh, interesting. Uh, separately. But the ramp style right here, how it resets ah. is the slide reciprocates. Okay. So it's actually moving straight forward and back. Okay. And this is engaging the safety. And this is actually the reset, sorry, in the rear. Okay. So I still love a lot of the theory of this simplified ramp style. It's just the degree of complexity of having this separate trigger bar in it uh, ended up being problematic. So you have the brick here. And where did it go? What was the next step after this? At some point, I guess, you looked at this and you're like, all right, we've, we've learned something. And we're right, we have to move to the next prototype. We, we learned a ton. Um, we just we learned about how much it costs, what materials to go with, um, how you actually interact with a machine shop. Our big breakthrough here was the placement of the recoil mechanism and our barrel, what started to be the barrel design, uh, the original inspiration. And this is where, like I said, a lot of the things I still hadn't got my hands on. Uh, the inspiration was a Webley 1913 455 autoloader. Nice. Uh, because they'd used side um, yeah. brands. Yeah. Uh, side cuts, lugs. Or it would be a camera lug technically on those side cuts. Cammed lug? Okay. <laughs> uh, you if you're curious about how the Webley 1913 works, check out the other video I have on the Webley 1913. <laughs> I'll throw that shameless plug in there. That's awesome. So. But yeah, we learned just a lot of what not to do, but that we had something that we believed could go for. Now it was still theoretical. Uh, this did not fire more than two rounds at a time. Wow. Okay. But it fired. But it did fire. It did fire. And All right. And we had gained enough knowledge to put together a bare bones business plan. We had put our money into it and our uh, savings. And then we were able to go pitch. Hey, we have hmm. we have some knowledge. We have some, some uh, property here that hasn't been done before. We believe in it. Uh, going with us to the next level. Okay. And the next level was the boat anchor, which I don't know when I, I'd heard that name. I'd heard you say that name several times before you actually brought out the pistol. I'm like, wow, that, that actually looks really nice. It doesn't deserve such a disparaging name, but it is kind of heavy. It is. It is a very heavy pistol. So clearly much more polished manufacturing. This one isn't 3D printed. Uh, ball end mill. Uh, that was another design for manufacturability thing we pulled together is that that was a very expensive pistol to make. Okay. You know, it's interesting compared to the production huds and it does, it feels like it has a narrower grip and I actually, it really feels good in the hand. It's not as low. I think we'll get to that. <laughs> Excuse me. But um, why not maintain that that narrower grip. It is incredibly thin in the hand because at this point we uh, decided to try to build our own magazine without any uh, reference point to history or something that had gone before. Um, that also didn't go so well. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons that magazines are designed the way they are. And um, whenever you look at some of the older magazines, they're more narrow, your high power, I'll, but that is even narrower than a high power. Wow. So, okay. yeah, it was, we were trying to get a certain grip circumference, a poor decision. Okay. So you went a little too far to one extreme and then a little too far to the other extreme, and then you finally came back to the, the middle ground compromise. Yep. Oh, fair is fair. That one could, re uh, could uh, what, basically feed five at a time. Uh, without issue once we got it dialed in. A 250% improvement in reliability. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on this guy, we still have, we have no trigger dingus, um, still have manual thumb safeties. Feel pretty good, by the way. That's Don't pinch yourself. Okay. <laughs> I see. Ask you how you know. <laughs> um, and what else? Uh, I'm assuming you've got some iteration in the, the barrel design. So let's take this one apart, and it looks like you've improved the uh, 
the disassembly technique here. So, in theory, I'm thinking I push this pin. Nope, not on that one. I mar the gun up. Uh, do you have to have it locked open? Or, ah, we rotate it first, then, no? <laughs> Uh, you're just gonna make me figure this out, aren't you? I'm over here laughing. There, 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 <laughs> there were reasons we, go. we didn't go to Ooh. market with this. All right, so lock it open, and then you can rotate this pin and pull it out. See, now I know the trick, and I know you have to do this with the production ones too. So you get it to about there, pull the trigger. Ah! All right, we got that one. Ooh, and then bits fall out. <laughs> So you now have a captive, a more captive recoil spring. Um, I think just so people can see the comparison there. That's a substantial change in recoil spring design. And then pull out the barrel. Ooh, you still have the round locking lugs in this one, don't you? All right, so there's the brick barrel and the boat anchor barrel. And um, this actually looks like it's pretty much the exact same design, just Got, a, got away from the oversized uh, barrel wall. All right. So you still have, I'm surprised to see you still have these rounded locking lugs. I thought you said that was going to be virtually impossible to manufacture. So we had an iterative step here, and it, was, it made it very challenging, but this is actually the beginning of our adoption of an insert chassis. This ah. is a separate piece pinned in. Okay. These these lugs they were machined as a separate piece and then pinned in. Uh, that was still very very complicated. We used a circular piece to reference point, but actually getting it in there with the rails still overly complicated. Okay, but at this point, this is something that you can actually manufacture. It may be expensive and difficult, but it's not not integral to the frame, which yeah would be flat out nightmarish to try and make. All right, and we definitely have a massive change in in the fire control group back here. So this uh, this sear mechanism, and you can see that right here, your slide's going to recock that. Okay. That is something that we had not seen. We have not found something very similar to at all, which was very interesting for us. The biggest difference is that you don't have that traditional lever arm for a striker-fired pistol. You're all contained in a yoke. The yoke is acting on a lever inside and is dropping. Okay. Now, if you look right here. Ah, yes. So that, you had a, a larger polymer model of this. That's, now, I thought you said that was the disconnector? So, pull uh, pull the trigger. This down. The slide pushes it that pushes it down. up, and then the slide as it cycles pops in and pushes that toward it. You okay. can see this is right here a relief cut in the slide for it not to act until the slide actually recoils. Right there. Okay. And we're used to seeing that sort of thing 90 degrees perpendicular. Usually you see that in a pin that's operating up and down, mm -hmm. not laterally into the slide. So that seems like a pretty good solution. It was very interesting solution and very, very, uh, I'll say novel, but in a complimentary way. Uh, the issue is the small number of small parts that are in that mechanism. I think it's around seven to ten small parts, and for manufacturability, very difficult to assemble. Okay, that, yeah, yeah, I can see that too. Um, and probably not the greatest thing for getting dirty either. Not at all. All right. So let's see. What else do we have in the slide here? Uh, looks like, it, honestly, it looks like pretty much the same thing in the slide with a few of the parts moved around. You still have your striker. And of course, one of your um, basic core concepts was to have this be striker fired and not hammer fired. Absolutely. And we, we, we actually told ourselves we are not going to reinvent the wheel unless we have to, which kind of turned out to be a funny uh, motto for us once we got to our final product we reinvented a few wheels but, uh, <laughs> okay put some rubber on them instead of making them wood and that kind of thing so with this design you clearly have 
it's way more professional looking. This looks a lot. This looks like it might be a functioning pistol, not just a prototype proof of concept sort of thing. Um, but there's still progress to be made on it. Oh, I, and if we had gone with a a magazine tube that functioned, uh, I believe that this would have been a functioning uh, pistol that we would have, you know, had a chance to actually test and go through and uh, iterate a few times. The, the choice of the magazine is what forced us to abandon that, and we still were not happy with where our, our grip purchase, uh, the low bore axis was in the back. We, we took a big step toward uh, removing a lot of material there and redesigning the sear again in order to accomplish that whenever we took the next step. Okay. I think we're going to see that in the very next iteration. And I mean, this looks like a pretty slick design. Uh, it's really, you don't see it in context until you put it next to the final product. So this is the third iteration of the gun. And at this point, I think this is the one where you got all of the mechanical elements into their basically what is their final form. Correct. And so it's interesting, if you look at the, the pin right here, and then compare it to, let's flip this one around, that pin on this model, you cut something like, it looks like almost a quarter inch, out of the height of the slide. You brought that slide down substantially. It was, it was aggressive. It was, uh, we, we worked really hard to do that. And the, the engineers, the farm engineers that took over the project at this point, um, we basically said, our baby's ugly. And they, <laughs> they were like, well, this is actually a very neat, elegant, you know, novel design. We said, but our baby's ugly. We need, we need to get the hand higher. And so we had to relook at the sear in order to do that. Okay, so uh, before we go all the way in, at this point you've also changed the magazine tube. So this gun, the grip on this is, it's wider, and it's actually square, you pointed this out, it's squared off across the front where the final production guns are a little more rounded. Correct. Um, so you have a, you now presumably have a magazine that works. We do. Um, it was a 5906 tube, uh, which is old Smith & Wesson design based off the high power tube. Okay. So it's one of, it has a lot of heritage and a lot of, um, we were, you know, a second ago we were throwing in, uh, I believe a day where we were <laughs> other magazines showing that it's, it's very similar, a lot of heritage. Yeah. And we went with that in order to have something proven, but it had to be slim enough to, for a yoke to fit around it and right. still accomplish how slim of a grip we were going for. What modern magazines have done, since they don't have a trigger yoke, they have the room uh, to make it wider. Right. And uh, that actually makes it a little bit, for the engineering, a little bit easier. So it was a challenge to figure that out, and we wanted to kind of use 80 to 90 years of experience on our side there. Okay. And you've also added the infamous trigger dingus. <laughs> <laughs> I keep saying that. It's a trigger safety. It is. Um, a la Glock and many other modern designs. But at this point, you've got that, and you also have the manual thumb safety. Um, was there a particular thought process there? Why, why add this if you've got a manual safety? At this point, we started moving toward a chassis design, and we started um, really moving toward the idea of if we're going to do this, we have to differentiate. And what do we want? Well, we started basically doing many focus groups with people who love the guns. Do you want a safety? Do you not want a safety? Do you want a left hand, right hand, and B? Do you want a trigger? It's a personal preference. It's like sights or holsters. Okay. And we wanted to create the ability for the end user to configure the pistol how they wanted it. Okay. Which, in retrospect, probably cost us three months of our lives that uh, we, we didn't have to spend. But I'm actually glad that we did because once we were able to put the, the optional thumb safeties out there, I think it's going to be really awesome for people to decide how they want to carry their own pistol. Okay, so the end result is all of the production guns have a trigger safety. So that's integral to the drop safety mechanism as well. And then they are coming from the factory right now with no manual safeties, but that is going to be an add-on option that you can get and, if I understand it correctly, just drop it into any existing pistol. It's going to be a slight uh you know, you're going to need to know how to depress a detent spring, rotate out a end cap, and then follow the directions on the manual we send out. But other than that, it, for anyone who 
who spends time uh, messing with uh, Glock triggers, MMP triggers, or doing a self-installation, it'll be familiar. It'll be slightly different looking than this. Uh, we made the aesthetic to fit the production H9 slightly different. Okay. So, if you can assemble AR parts together, not a big deal. Great. And if not, I'm sure your gunsmith will be happy to take <laughs> on that job and charge you some money for it. Um, all right, so... I know at some point you've changed the barrel locking lug, so I'm gonna see if that's what we have here. Now I, all right, on this one, now we've, we've got the disassembly technique from the final iteration of the gun, which is push the pin through till it snaps, and then rotate it down. Ooh, this one keeps going. Is it just, I think it's just vertical. And then I'm going to pull the trigger. Yeah. And oh, we still have bits falling out, so you're not quite all the way through uh, through development here, not are you? Yet. All right, there's that, and then yes, that is a substantially different barrel. So the round bits are gone now. Now you've got angular bits, which that actually with with the use of the 5906 tube is pretty fun because if you look at a Smith and Wesson 39, the angles and how their lockup ended up being something that we used and integrated into our side cams. Okay. Interesting. So this guy is going to lock right in there, I presume. And move forward right there and then continue. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Nice. And your recoil spring is, again, located way down here. Um, so. You, what this allows you to do is basically free up a lot of space in this area and thus bring the slide down. The best visual thing uh, for anyone to see is actually putting it side to side with a 1911 and seeing how much surface area is above the trigger guard on a 1911 to where the slide finally goes. Well, that, so if I've lined up the bottom of the trigger guards there, yeah, that is a lot more material sticking up. You can't quite see it from your perspective, but I've got it set up for the camera. And yeah, that's really substantial. So when you're getting, I mean, when you're getting to about the mid of the retaining pin on uh, that mechanism, you've bottomed out and we're already into our barrel on the yeah. H9. And so nice. that's really a, a visual for people whenever they wondered what we did with the surface area. What we, we didn't get rid of any Really, we, we moved it. We reallocated our surface area down in front. Right. Okay. And by this iteration, you have also made a bunch of changes. Well, you made oh, yes. some changes to that. The basic... So the, the mechanism looks relatively similar still. You've still got your, like your rocker bar sear here. Um, but it's definitely... It's narrower, for one thing. And it looks like you have gotten rid of this side mounted piece and we've gone to a vertical disconnector ah okay that's what you've added up there in the front the other right. big difference is your spring while there are multiple springs nested horizontally within that and then one up here mm -hmm. the spring is a leaf spring down the back that's pushing ah. everything forward okay i think you said you tried to avoid using a flat leaf <clears throat> spring like that i think that was uh the miss Miss, uh, let's see, misuse of a historical case study. Uh, the board chart was actually one hmm. because in that instance, the movement from a leaf spring to, I believe, the coil spring down the back of the Luger um, saved a lot of space. Right. That was a huge improvement. Well, reverse it. I'm moving to a leaf spring and not any other kind of coil spring down the back of ours is what saves space. Okay. So you've got a, a leaf spring with two fingers on it, very much like a 1911 spring under the back strap right here. Correct. Okay, and that's what's motivating the, the fire control mechanism. Okay, there we go. Now, this little round protrusion right here is also new uh, in this iteration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have anything like that over here. So, um, what is that? And that is the, uh, it's the striker block safety disconnector, which is basically means yeah, that that, I'm tight. that, 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 <laughs> that rotates up and disengages the striker uh, drop blocks. It's the striker safety, but what most people associate with a drop safety in a striker okay. fired pistol. Okay. So the 
yeah, you can see the trigger yoke there. I mean, this is going backwards a little bit, but um, the other alternative to a trigger yoke like this is actually having the fire control mechanism go up through the slide, like on high power. Oh, that, I think that would also explain why your final production magazine is 15 rounds, where a lot of other modern production guns are 16 or 17 or 18. It's because they can have a wider magazine body because they don't have this yoke that has to split around the magazine. So there's multiple reasons. One is definitely that we have a, a slimmer traditional style magazine, but it's also how far we put the slide on top of the grip. If we had gone with a 17 round, the uh, balance, the look and balance of the pistol would look off because the grip would be, you know, a little bit longer. And we actually modeled one that way and we couldn't find anybody who just wasn't just like, that just looks weird. <laughs> We had we had enough challenges with getting the aesthetics right where we didn't want to add one more challenge. Okay, fair enough. So this is almost there, but not quite. The uh, barrel mm -hmm. ends up changing a little bit, and then these two lugs get substantially thicker. All right. Well, let's take a look at the uh, the final production version. All right. So this is the actual almost. Well, this is prototype number sixty four. Uh, but this is basically what's coming off the production line now, right? Yeah, very, very close. Uh, one of the reasons that the slide was used is it uh, has slight finishing uh, issues. As you see, it's more gray than black. Okay. So that was why it was used as one of the prototype parts. Okay. And at this point, you still don't have your own gun because you're shipping everything that comes off the line. So this is the closest you can get. And right now, that's what we're using whenever we're going out to the range. All right. So disassembly on this is push... You can do that with a finger if your fingers are set up right, uh, or a tool. Push that through, rotate it down, and then pull the trigger, and... Oh, and then hold, you have to hold the, that's the one trick here, is you have to hold the barrel up. There we go. Which just, I'm assuming, pulls it out of its, keeps it out of the locking recesses. Correct. All right, ooh, you've added wings to the barrel. <laughs> So yeah, so you've taken this surface and actually reduced it by a fair amount. That is correct. There's also one big change that we learned during testing, and actually it had nothing to do with uh, the spec. The drawing was correct, but what we were having, and let me make sure I grab the correct. Yeah, we've got a whole mess of Hudson parts on this table now. <laughs> it's dropping in and what we found is that unless we made the surface and let me know if I'm not in camera mm -hmm. here yep, you're good. we didn't make this the distance of this surface to this surface and forward in the barrel a critical dimension mm -hmm. and we had these out slightly at all these would start impacting they aren't supposed to impact they're supposed to guide uh. what's supposed to impact is this large okay yeah the flat lug, surface at the bottom onto this rather large flat surface and all these are supposed to be was guides but we okay. had some of those breaking early on and we we realized that we had to make that a critical dimension or we'd continue to see that so that was one of the big lessons learned that we had and if you want to bring the proof of concept over here right, we yeah, we this did guy. this anyway if you can look at the thickness whoa wow yeah almost doubled mm -hmm. okay and we basically decided if we can make that as thick and bulky and beefy as possible, we should. Why not? There's okay. no reason not to. And uh, so that was very similar to the one that we sent to Recoil Magazine. Not, mm. not trying to give someone else a plug, but whenever they did the review and broke it at 1,200 rounds, that was when we made that decision just just beef it up. And the next iteration, we got you know past our 10,000 round piece spec. So okay, nice. Um, and this one now has a captive recoil spring in it. Yeah. Unless you were given a third hand at birth to hold that recoil spring in place, we figured this was a better option. Uh, off camera, when we were putting these things back together, it is in fact a huge pain to try and line up. You're trying to hold, like, hold the trigger, hold the slide, hold the barrel, and then line up the recoil spring by, like, holding it right side up and kind of jiggling it. And yeah, so, and the way you did this is pretty cool. So at this point, you actually have a whole removable chassis in inside the frame. Um, kind of akin to some of the modular pistols that are just coming out now. Uh, and it's the chassis that actually locks this recoil spring in place. 
Correct. Um, and that field stripping is uh, you take the slide off and you can spray down and you don't have to get to your recoil spring except to spray it off and make sure it's fine. Uh, once you get down to a gunsmith level and start taking it down, you're going to remove your safety plug-in caps. Okay. And you're going to remove the retaining takedown pin and then the chassis is going to rotate out and that's where you'll be able to access that uh, recoil spring. Okay. Nice. So, yeah, by this point, you've really lowered the slide. I mean, let's just compare this to, to the original there. And, like, you know, the location of the beaver tail. Pretty much all of this material is just gone now. <laughs> all of it. Um, what I do it looks a lot nicer, too. Yeah, what I do <laughs> love about the brick is that you can see the uh, origin. You can actually see in that goofy big howitzer barrel... You bring it to this barrel, and you can see where it started. And that gets, you know, that that is really fun uh, for us to see. Is that we we saw the you can see the direction and the progression as we headed through it in the refinement. Yeah, for sure. The slide is intentionally unremarkable, in in the exception of one thing that I is how thick we made this flange you have to because otherwise that thing's going to snap oh, off yes that's correct um in fact you know what that reminds me of is the the sig 220s where they had on the the 220 the slide is a bent piece of sheet metal mm -hmm. and then the breech block and the front plug are basically inserted into it mm -hmm. and um i don't remember which designation it was but astra copied it and astra had problems with over time this front plug would like bend out under pressure and fall off and that was a bad thing so, yeah, you absolutely, you want that much material up there. Absolutely. That thing, I mean, you've got, especially the amount you've dropped the recoil spring here, you're putting a huge lever arm absolutely. on that. Um, That's a good point. Well, and then let's see if it's the proof of concept or not. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. So neither of these are the examples, but at one point we opened up in order to have better timing on the uh, slide catch we opened up this cut and it actually went through to the rails right, if, you were, if you're designing a Sorry. pistol slide i highly recommend you don't do that so which, which say that again which cut uh, these cuts we were having timing issues with our hmm. slide catch and so oh, what we okay. did is we just blew through two and it isn't on either of these models i guess we had discarded those slides to make sure we didn't test with them anymore but we had blown through to those rails and it had cost us uh we had cracks in the slide i forgot what iteration hmm. it was but we just combined them again 79 percent reduction in stress on that huh. on that area it was just but which was just an insane number over the number of rounds that we were we were doing so uh continuous continuous rails on the internals of your slide very very key okay I guess you would get a, if you cut into that rail, that gives you a pretty good crack propagation point right at the corner, doesn't it? Well, absolutely. And it was, uh, oh, I'm going to reach this across. Yeah. Because of where those sat, I'm going to get the right pistol, because of where our slide sat in right here, mm -hmm. the rail surfaces, there was just a small moment where it was free floating across and it ah. was causing an incredible amount of stress. Huh. Okay. So that was actually a, a big moment whenever uh, we were like, let's, let's, let's put the rails back together and see what goes. Worry about the timing issue another way. All right. Well, that's a pretty cool display to see there. All, all four generations pulled apart. Um, anything you think we missed in this? Uh I'm sure if uh, we went through stuff like design for manufacturability, why we did some of the uh, the cuts we did, the look, um, we could get into it. Now, I, I could probably talk about it for about a week. Um, <laughs> but the, the main points, I think I think we hit those. So uh, it's quite an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Well, very cool. I think there are a lot of people out there who really have, with modern pistols, you don't often get a chance to see where did this actually start out. So I really appreciate you bringing all of these down so that we can see that. Thank you for uh, hosting us. Really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. Oh. Could get lost in all the guns and the stuff you have here. <laughs> that, that, I, you could leave me here for a week.
be happy to have you. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, seeing the origins of the Hudson H9. Uh, if you do enjoy seeing this sort of thing, please do consider checking out my Patreon page. It is uh, folks there at a buck a month who really do make it possible for me to bring you guns like this uh, over the net. Thanks for watching.